th this is a very exciting time for fusion and for developing what we we call the data science ecosystem for fusion and that's a big part of the reason why we're here and next week we're going to go to uh, germantown to talk to ben brown and other people at oscar and fes about our vision the, the practical tangible progress we have made towards that vision the the missing pieces the gaps where we're heading and a sense of the the, the scale of the undertaking and the the importance of concentrating resources in a timely way to meet the fusion challenge. So again, thank you very much for your hospitality. Um, that's it. So uh, just a quick intro, what is magnetic confinement fusion? The goal is to fuse uh, tritium with uh, deuterium hydrogen isotopes to produce a, a helium or rather an alpha particle and a neutron. Most of the energy is carried by the neutron. The idea is to inject in a, in this case, a magnetic confinement device. I'm using here EDA that is being built in the south of France as exemplar. We have essentially a, a magnetic bottle we inject a deuterium tritium fuel mixture in various ways gases or pellets we turn on the magnets and drive a current in the toroidal direction so that we generate closed magnetic surfaces that then bind the particles to those surfaces except for the effects of collisions we heat that to about 100 million degrees, so we have a plasma state. And when we have successful collisions, mostly in the core of this device, we'll produce energetic uh, particles, fusion products, fragments. One is, of course, the, uh, the alpha particles that will be confined in the magnetic bottle, and the other is the neutrons that will escape and will capture that in in blankets and the blanket is supposed to convert that neutronic energy into uh, thermal energy that can drive a turbine for instance and produce electricity but it's also integral to the fuel cycle to use those neutrons to react with uh, other elements to produce more tritium which is the uh, rarer of the isotopes that are needed for the fuel. So if you then look at ITER and you ask, why is ITER so big? So here is a representation of a person right down there in the, in the lower portion of the, the schematic for ITER. You can see the scale of this, and it's substantially larger than any existing magnetic confinement device in the world today. And the reason why it's so big is the following. A successful fusion reaction will produce an energy gain of about 400. That's fantastic to have that kind of an energy gain. Unfortunately, most collisions are not successful. And so in order to be able to confine these particles long enough that you will have one successful collision out of thousands of unsuccessful if you will, glancing collisions as opposed to a head-on collision, you need lots of volume. Uh, volume in a normalized sense is lots of particle orbit scale lengths. Or another way to think about it is many, many collisions uh, would be required to lose your particles and the energy that they carry. So you need something big. And either is about the right scale to deal with the the problem of uh, infrequent uh, productive collisions. Um, there are other ways uh, as well that involve scale in a dimensionless sense. Either is on the large size of what we could imagine 
uh, for building a reactor. And it's a, it's a massive project, a massive undertaking. And there is a great deal of focus now on building more compact devices, principally through using higher magnetic fields and also improved ideas for confining the plasma, getting more pressure uh, for a given magnetic field. So ITER is one of the major mega science projects that are coming up. Uh, you've, you know others, the CMS or ATLAS detectors, again, for the Large Hadron Collider, these are mega, all mega science projects. In fact, ITER is just 350 odd kilometers south of uh, Geneva, where the Large Hadron Collider is based. And Eli and others at ESNet have a lot of experience getting massive amounts of data out of LHC experiments. And so we hope to tap into that wealth of experience a decade or more of experience to get up and running with EDA. Here is a view of the scale of EDA, and here's a, a worker. Here's one, All right? So these are these are actually people, and uh, you're looking down into this. It, it, uh, it it's truly a massive scale experiment. I thought it would be nice just to give you a sense of. Uh, the scale of this thing. Um, here's another view. These are segments of the toroidal field vacuum vessel. These are all going to come together, 16 toroidal segments. And uh, it's very easy to fly through this without hitting the edges. It's not like dunking a basketball in a net, right? Nothing but net. This is very easy to, <laughs> to fly through. And it's a lot of fun. It just shows you the scale of this uh, undertaking. So how are we preparing for EDA? Right now, there is an EDA worldwide network of sorts. It's a loose configuration. To call it a network is a bit of a stretch. But basically, it's, and these are only a few of the operating facilities today, D3D in San Diego, there's MastU in uh, the UK, there's West in just uh, within a mile of EDA itself, a very, very useful facility there. There's K-Star in Korea. There's new facilities coming up in Japan. And there are others, very significant facilities. And together, we call this a loose confederation of collaborating programs. Um, and the idea here is to prepare for EDA is to really identify the physics that is generic and not specific to each individual facility. And given that we still have a great deal of progress to make in fundamental understanding, it's very important that when we learn a trick on one facility, even if we think we understand it from a scientific perspective, and we develop a method in terms of a practical um, uh, implementation of an idea that improves performance, we still have to make sure that that knowledge is transferable and generic and can be extrapolated to EDA. So I'll come back to this and give a sense of where we want to move this in the future. But, but the, the big picture is we want to create a much more substantial international worldwide network based on the data science ecosystem that needs to be, we believe, is essential to enable fusion and EDA to succeed. And the US is clearly leading in this area right now. And with appropriate support from Oscar and DUE, uh, we can actually show the way for the rest of the world in terms of developing an internationally connected data science ecosystem that really enables um, uh, fusion to move forward and enables EDA to achieve its milestones expeditiously. 
So I pointed out the D3D facility. D General Atomics operates D3D for the Department of Energy. It's a DOESC user facility, and it is the primary US facility for simulating ETA. So we can operate D3D in various ways to simulate relevant dimensionless parameters for ETA. And the idea is that we will develop this data science ecosystem, demonstrate it, validate it, show its utility for driving scientific innovation and efficient exploitation of a fusion facility. And by that means, establish the modalities and the, the appropriate you know, level of um, analysis and, and infrastructure that is needed to guide either experiments and to guide the design and operation of a future US pilot plant. Um, just to give you some figures, there are 830 researchers worldwide uh, actively engaged in D3D experiments. The, something that will come up later is D3D produces plasma pulses. Roughly 10 second interval, uh, 10 second pulses with about you know, 15 to 20 minute intervals between pulses. So that gives you time to plan the next pulse. It gives you time to understand what you got and to kind of load in to the control system what you want, to, what you want for the next shot. Um, the key strengths of D3D are that it, it's a very flexible device from the point of view of control and from the point of view of the accessibility of the configuration space. And this has made it a real world leader in fusion. It's one of the top experimental programs, scientific programs in the world in terms of contributing substantial design elements to ITER, for instance, and also to a future pilot plant. It's also a tremendous uh, platform for model validation because over the years we've developed, and the US is a leader in this in general, but D3D is clearly an outstanding example in the US and worldwide. We've developed a suite of uh, very powerful diagnostic instruments that allows us to rigorously test our physics models. And for these two reasons, it's rather unique in the world. So where are we? We're building EDA. And at the same time, we had this White House summit in 2022 that came forward with a decadal vision for fusion. And it was a commitment that we will achieve fusion power on the grid in a decadal time scale, which means that the US will develop in parallel with EDA operation, a compact, commercially feasible compact fusion pilot plant that can put energy on the grid in the mid 30s. The good news is that there is very strong private industry engagement now. Over the last couple of years, private industry has raised, I believe, more than $4 billion to fund uh, private fusion activities. We expect on a similar time scale, ITER to operate by about 2035. The key attribute that makes ITER unique is from the very beginning of its design, it is, it is very specifically a scientific experiment. That is, for, for it being a nuclear reactor, with all the constraints that that imposes, it is still a flexible scientific experiment in a nuclear environment. So we, the, the eater itself is complementary to, uh, to private uh, activities and 
both the private activities and EDA have to solve one major problem, and that is to realize the vision for at least the tokamak path to fusion, which is the one that is closest to achieving fusion conditions, we have to solve the controllability challenge. And we have to solve it on existing facilities, this international network of machines that I discussed earlier. We have to develop robust, effective control solutions before the operation of ITER and well before the operation of a pilot plant. And this was the topic of town hall discussions on artificial intelligence within the DOE. And there's a document that was produced on this, but it's, it's clear that across the whole DOE SC infrastructure, there's a push to leverage data science to advance innovation, improve efficiency of user facilities. But for fusion, it's an existential issue. It's not just accelerating science, and it's not just operating out facilities more efficiently, we have to solve the control challenge. And to give you an idea of what that control challenge is, no, I thought the, the movie would run. So that's okay. So what this movie would have shown is a plasma disruption. And if you just imagine that this volume here is looking at a section of a, of a torus, in this case, the, the uh, torus supra tokamak in Europe. But you can see that the plasma has this halo around it. And this is a ring of visible light that comes off the cool edge of the plasma. But you also see hotspots. And that is where the plasma is actually interacting with material surfaces. And that is one of the problems that fusion has is the plasma interaction with material surfaces and how that affects the core of the plasma because if you interact with material surfaces and this is just a snapshot of the control challenge if you interact with material surfaces then you will get what we call impurities blow off those surfaces those impurities can then blow into the plasma it can then cool the plasma push you away from fusion conditions, but more importantly as well, it can things called major disruptions where you then trigger an instability and that instability basically terminates the discharge and loads the walls with heat and particle and electromagnetic forces because there's a lot of magnetic energy stored in that plasma. And this is part of the challenge that we need to resolve and we haven't fully resolved it. There's been advances particularly with machine learning in developing inference engines that are getting better and better at predicting and avoiding disruptive events. But uh, there's a great deal of progress that still needs to be made. And we have to demonstrate that those solutions are transferable and they're also interpretable for the operation of a nuclear reactor. And so the key challenge in the control sense is, can we sustain the fusion triple product? Can we have enough density at the right temperature with sufficient confinement to generate commercially relevant levels of fusion power production while preventing these things called disruptions, which are instability events? Yes. So there's a question online um, asking about uh, but doesn't the plasma need to touch the surface to transfer out the energy? Correct. How is, the, how is that possible? So the way that that is done is you want to mitigate that energy as much as possible by using, in part, by using radiators. And this is part of the challenge. So earlier I said if the plasma exhibits a significant excessive interaction with the material surface, it can blow off material from that surface. The way we mitigate that is to try to cool the edge of the plasma. The way we do that is by, in part, by injecting impurities that radiate, you know, efficient radiators. Well, but this sounds a little bit tricky because 
if you inject material to radiate from the edge, does that material get into the core? And does it dampen or otherwise affect the efficiency or the stability of the fusion reaction? And the answer is yes. So it's, yeah, go ahead, Dave. So what the other thing is, how do you get the power to make electricity, which may have been part of the question. Ah, but that's the neutron blanket. Removed. That's the neutron blanket. So the neutrons just stream out, right? And they're just captured inside a, essentially the a molten lithium uh, flowing barrier that will capture the neutrons. It will both produce uh, fuel in the form of tritium production that will be captured as part of the the, um, the the fuel cycle of managing the tritium flow, uh, the lithium flow, and also heats the molten lithium, which then transfers energy to uh, good old pipes and uh, steam and the usual. That's how we get the electricity. The way that the reaction is sustained is by the alpha particles that remain trapped in the core because they follow the field lines. And then the trick is to keep the edge of the plasma cool in terms of the thermal that the plasma presents to the walls. So, so balancing these things, you can imagine, is, can be quite complex. The, the, I want to say here, the control challenge is also a data challenge. We found that with rapid progress with machine and AI to develop sophisticated, um, if you will, inference engines that can better predict the 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 uh, the trajectory, if you will, of the plasma, and that trajectory has to be updated in real time. But the the data available for those inference engines is somewhat different, particularly in terms of physics models. And that's important because for we require interpretable models. What does that mean? It means it's not enough for us to put all the data in the box and to say we've got the perfect disruption avoidance system. And then the regulator agency will say, well, how does it work? We'll say, well, it's a black box. Okay, so is this guaranteed to work in the future just because it's worked in the past? Yeah, we don't know. How does it work? Yeah, we don't know. It's not acceptable. We're building new reactors, and so our control systems have to be interpretable. You have to be able to back that out in terms of physical principles and understanding of causes and effects and how plasma works, how engineering components work in the presence of plasma. And so this is a real challenge for us, and it can only be resolved with deeper understanding of what happens in the plasma, plasma interactions with the materials. So what's the connection to superfacility? The key point understand is that fusion data is abundant. There's not as much fusion data as there is, say, data CMS detectors. The key thing about fusion data is it's multimodal. There are many different types of instruments measuring many different physical parameters, from magnetic fields to temperatures, densities, uh, impurity concentrations, material surface property, a lot of data is collected in many different uh, forms by different instrument packages that measure different things. So fusion data is abundant, but information is limited in the following sense. In order to make sense of what the data is telling us, we first and foremost must reconstruct the plasma state. So what does that mean? It means we need essentially a mathematical description of the shape of these magnetic surfaces, 
and the properties of the the kinetic properties of the plasma on those magnetic surfaces. And this is called plasma reconstruction, and it's proven to be a very powerful representation of the plasma if you want to understand the detailed physics, the stability of the plasma, the dominant transport mechanisms of the plasma, the um, you know, the magnetohydrodynamic and stability boundaries, the heat flux to the wall, all of this can be understood if we reconstruct the plasma state. Now, up until very recently, up until the time when we began the super facility project with you folks, reconstruction was a very labor intensive process. It was slow, it required manual work by individuals. It required an intense amount of thinking and careful selection of data and fitting of the data and integrating data from the various instruments and making sure that you could integrate it in just the right way that you could then run a, a reconstruction algorithm that gave you the shape of the magnetic surfaces and the physical properties of the plasma on those surfaces. To give you an idea, the amount of data that has been processed to reconstruct the plasma state is, I would say, probably less than 0.1% of the entire available data for reconstruction. On D3D, and this is the same. This is the same situation on every international fusion experiment. And so, the amount of data, quality data, that can inform physics of what's going on is highly limited. Although data is abundant, this was the major bottleneck that we recognized. And so, when we saw the opportunity of super facility, we said. We could do a lot of things with super facility. We could take a signal and take its FFT and maybe, you know, a scattering, you know, electromagnetic scattering. You could look at, or interferometer data, and you could take an FFT and you could look at what the MHD modes are, or what the different spectrum of fluctuation. There's many things you can do. But the real bottom understanding and control is plasma state. So, Armed with this, we realized that we automated plasma state reconstruction and then model-based analysis on that state reconstruction was the essential uh, bottleneck for us. And that's what super facility provides. And you can understand now, if you can analyze 99.9% .9 of the data, instead of point, it's truly transformative. And that's the vision that we had in this regard. And so we started the super facility activity. We spoke at about, I think, March of 2020. We spoke with Oscar and FES program managers. We showed them that we could automate this very labor intensive process. And we could do enough to bring us back to the control room. That was exciting proposition. Please go ahead. Uh, so there's another question uh, online um, related to this. Would fusion experiments benefit if data was sent to the supercomputer and received back in real time? That's what we're doing. Time. Yeah, near real time. That's what the super facility is. So again, when we realized that this was the bottleneck, we said, how can we a, inform control decisions that is understand better what the plasma state was from the prior pulse and use that information to better plan for the next plasma pulse. So the first motivation is to bring actionable information to the control room. The second motivation is to run this automated analysis to back propagate the analysis all through the D3D data archive and to 
literally transform the quality of data that we have available for developing, um, you know, improved engines that can improve our understanding and control of fusion. So this was the real opportunity. And so we met with Oscar folks and FES folks, and we did a reasonable job of convincing them that we had a straight shot at this and we received funding to do so. And the, the journey has been really wonderful because the, the, uh, the uh, progress has been dramatic. Here is an example of what super facility does, high quality automated reconstruction of the plasma state. This is really a first for fusion. And I really have to say it's thanks to Oscar and FES program managers who understood the vision and believed that in fact we could do it. Of course, the onus was on us to deliver. The project team is terrific folks that at Berkeley, uh, Laurie, Steffi, and others, you're, you're in this room. Thanks so much for uh, really being in the project and, and throwing yourselves at it. It's just uh, beautiful. Uh, uh, Debbie, thank you again for all your support. It's, it's been a real pleasure working with you at GA, got a terrific team of people. Um, and also Columbia University and Princeton University. It's been really a multi-institutional collaboration to pull this off. And at the end of the day, you end up with this kind of automation that takes this like 10, sec 10 second plasma pulse, slices it up, say 50 time slices in 50 time bins. And each bin, so 50 times in a pulse, you can generate the shape of the closed magnetic surfaces. Imagine these uh, toroidal surfaces, and we've just taken a cut through the torus, and you can see the, the shape of these magnetic surfaces that confine the particles, except for collisions. And then we have relevant profiles of temperature and density as a function of these surface labels. That's the key point. And this is the basic reconstruction representation of plasma and is absolutely fundamental to understanding and control with understanding. Just a, a little technical slide to tip my hat to the industrious and really outstanding young researchers that did all the heavy lifting. Most of the scientists that did the heavy lifting were just a few, just a few years out of their PhD. These are also the people that are most, most invested in the vision because they don't want to do science the way their parents did science. They don't want to do 20th century science. They want to show, in particular, that modern data science and modern computing can have a transformative impact, impact on fusion. And so this just gives you a scale of the amount of work that was done by this team and the progress that was made. Each of these is a part of the overall work to achieve this, this reconstruction, rapid reconstruction. And this is almost a temporal uh, going from left to right. Um, the earliest days, you can see the amount of time that each segment took. And some of the progress was really dramatic. Go, for instance, in this step here, from 116 seconds to 10 seconds. But some was much more gradual and more difficult to overcome. And some of the, the, break, the big breakthroughs happened in some of the steps happened later than earlier. And it was really a case of when you do this, it's a Pandora's box. You can't even grasp all the challenges you're going to have in dealing with legacy code that is designed to be an interactive tool with no specific timeliness goal in mind over you know a couple of generations of experience and physicists 
uh, playing with the tools. Now you say, let's automate it and make it fast. That's the Pandora's box. And that's what we're dealing with. And I think we're dealing with this with all legacy codes. So we had some idea at the beginning of the learning through where we could achieve uh, rapid progress, but a lot of the progress that was made resulted from issues that we didn't so it's a journey. And again, it, it's to the credit of this young team and their energy and enthusiasm that got to a valuable product in roughly a one year time frame. Because all of these issues will come up and they can potentially slow down or even stop the project. But you need, again, you need a talented, enthusiastic team of people that look at every challenge and find a solution and just barrel forward because they understand the vision, they understand the goal, they buy into it, they really believe in it. Um, so what does this capability allow us to do? Well, now we're being asked to layer analysis on top of the plasma state. Once you have a plasma state, you can do all sorts of things. You can identify what the dominant micro instabilities are that transport energy and particles from the core and momentum from the core to the edge. You can identify what the mechanisms are that transport energy from the edge of the plasma to the walls. You can identify the dominant instabilities and which instabilities are most dangerous for potentially terminating the discharge. You can identify all these things in a in a interpretable physics-based um, approach that then can build into control systems. So one of the things that we did was to use this information to calculate on mass stability of plasma to, to various instabilities. And that led recently, I don't have time to discuss it, but that led recently to one member of our team uh, having a PRL accepted for publication just last week, where each of these data points here left is an analysis based on a automated reconstruction of the plasma. It's really quite remarkable. And there's thousands of reconstructions that go into this simple plot. He was speaking to the D3D science team on Thursday, last Thursday, and he said that this was the first paper to come out of an experimental campaign that had been completed three months earlier. And partly the reason why this was the first paper is he tapped into this resource. Then, of course, everyone flooded him with requests for <laughs> making this resource available. There are advantages to being first, okay? Even if it's a service that you're providing to the community, the research team that developed this capability will get, you know, the significant papers and citations out of developing the capability. So the other is, you know, thermal transport. If we generate equilibrium automatically what we're showing here is uh, comparisons of different standard models based on gyrokinetic simulations of the underlying plasma instabilities that transport energy particles and momentum and what this plot shows is that immediately after you complete a single pulse on an experiment you get the plasma state information then in a very unemotional uninvolved way which you have to train theorists to to understand and accept you send this off to an automated routine that compares different transport models against each other and then you get a couple of hundred points in a scatter plot and you identify the deviations between the models and you try to understand what those deviations mean this is called statistical validation. It's the first time we're really doing statistical validation now in fusion. It may seem obvious to you that in science you want to do this, but remember, if your culture is all about 
carefully analyzing 0.1% in the data, and then carefully choreographing how you compare models to that data and publish the results as the end goal versus letting go of your models and just in an automated way, exercise them routinely uh, on 99.9% .9 of the data and see what comes out. And we believe that this is part of the transition to modern data science that Fusion needs. And so what's next? The answer is we're just at the beginning of our journey. Super facility is a very important part of the journey. I just want to mention that, I forgot to mention here, that um, 20 years of operation, of, over the last 20 years, and mostly over the last 12 years, when manual reconstruction was more or less uh, developed as a workflow, as a kind of standardized workflow. Like the entire D3D program, really over the last 12 years, has produced only 4,000 reconstructions. Right? We're producing 50 reconstructions per pulse. And the three months that we were running Super Facility, we produced 20,000 reconstructions, of which 10,000 were high quality reconstructions. That is, you could not differentiate that from the you know, in terms of qualities that a human would see as important. So that's 10,000 in three months versus 4,000 over 12, 12 or odd years. It, it's truly transformative. And, and also the advantage of super facility is it's reproducible. You know, you can actually differentiate plasma reconstructions according to the person that reconstructed the, the, the state. You don't want that variable, right? You know, how, how do you feed that into a machine? It doesn't look good. So, so it, but then what's, what's the, well, we are, so the whole point is we're, we're at the very beginning of a journey to accelerate progress and in, in future that really requires a comprehensive and seamless data ecosystem. And this is what we call integrated research infrastructure. And it's also, in my view, an expansion of what integrated research infrastructure means in the OSCAR sense. In the OSCAR sense, the integrated research infrastructure really you develop APIs, you have workflows, and those workflows can execute anywhere in the DOE OSCAR cyberspace. That's great. But we mean integrated research infrastructure is one level, a slightly different level that encompasses that. And it means we need a whole set of things to come into place and to work seamlessly in all control challenge. First and foremost, we need autonomous real-time control systems that perform mon modeling, anomaly detection, and of course, real-time autonomous control. And this needs, this infrastructure or this platform, if you will, needs to ingest inference engines. And we need to develop what's called supervisory control because oftentimes you have to make high-level decisions in real time on priorities for actuators. So some physics models will say, I'm getting too close to this operational boundary. I want this actuator to push me away from the operational boundary. But then another physics model will say, ah, ah, I need that actuator to push me away from because, and then we need a layer of supervisory control that makes priority decisions on which, which control modules get to access which actuators. So it's, it's a very complex engine that we're building here. And in order to really make it work, we need an infrastructure. Part of the infrastructure is what we discuss now, super facility. Super facility is 
once you complete a pulse on a, say on D3D or infusion experiment, you want very rapid high fidelity analysis. You want very rapid high fidelity physics-based analysis and interpretation of what went on. And that's the core of superfacility. But once you have that analysis, you want to feed all of that data into a database, right? Um, there's also, I'll come back to a digital twin in a second. Uh, it's, it's a glorified name for integrated modeling that, that integrates the control system, the plasma model, and the engineering, engineering models that describe the facility because it's all one thing. So you, you generate all this derived data, you generate information that imparts understanding on what actually happened. But all of this data needs to be fed into the data platform. So we're developing a fusion data platform, Brian Samueli is the PI for the fusion data platform. And it's all about being able to access and process data at scale, simulation data, experimental data, to produce these inference engines or to produce solutions that can be implemented into real-time control. Then, of course, there's always a role for high fidelity simulation, and I won't speak about that. That's a separate thing. But finally, you have all this information, and you want to fold that information into designing the next pulse. And that's where the digital twin platform comes in. What that platform represents is it holds onto as the boundary conditions of the simulation the the prevailing uh, limitations and conditions in the experiment in the facility at the time, what the facility can actually do, what the condition of the facility is, what the condition of the walls are to the extent that you can capture that. And then you, you use your inference engine and optimizations to predict what the control system has to do to achieve the target that you want in the next discharge. And you use that optimization with human in the loop, because it is a reactor, to set the parameters for your control system so that then you can press the button and your control system will execute fully autonomously. So this is a data science ecosystem. It involves super facility. It involves fusion data but it also involves a digital platform. You need a native time-dependent simulation capability where you can insert inference engines or different models with different physics fidelity and execute a time-dependent simulation and an optimization on that that integrates the control system, a model for the control system, a model for the plasma, and a model for the plant. And that right now is missing. Um, the fusion data platform has now just begun. So for the data platform, the focus is, again, Brian Stanley is the PI, the focus is to enable uh, machine learning and AI at scale. And this is for fusion multiple petabytes. And to ensure that the platform provides easy access to fusion data and machine learning tools for broad community participation. If you look at the NAIR report and you look at the D with AI for Science report, creating platforms that enable broad community participation in modern data science is essential, both for strategically for the US uh, to maintain leadership in data science in general. It's essential for workforce development, create access to these platforms for the student community, and also, uh, of course, for driving forward solutions in, um, uh, for fusion. It is also to guarantee model reproducibility and provenance of data and models. Again, this is a nuclear reactor. The regulators will be unimpressed if you cannot provide full accounting 
for where the data came from and where the models came from. So this will automatically keep track of all provenance. It'll provide a unified environment for experimental data simulation and plant data. We want to integrate all of this and provide all of that data in the same form for access to machine learning and AI model development. And ultimately, we need this to be multi-facility in nature. So we see this as integrating with the worldwide facilities in the future. Um, and also we will develop as part of this, the worked models, leading edge models that actually leverage all of the available data to demonstrate advances in machine learning and AI for uh, the most challenging fusion problems. Um, so in terms of digital, we've started, this, this looks a little bit raggedy, but what this is, is a um, absolute alignment of surfaces in a reactor is extremely important because you have fast particles whizzing around on magnetic field lines and those magnetic field lines tend to graze at very shallow angles, material surfaces. So what we're doing now is, is laser metrology of the entire plant to within 80 micron spatial, absolute spatial resolution. And we want to be able to build that into a digital twin platform. So I think that kind of realism is essential. So it's really um, integrating a digital uh, uh, twin platform development with, with real physical metrology, but also we need to integrate that. We'll, we're working with NVIDIA, integrate that with the Omniverse um, uh, capabilities. What's needed in the future is to also integrate this with a proper plasma simulator, something that's natively time dependent. We have uh, tools that we're working on in that area and to also integrate a model of the entire control system, because ultimately what you want to do is simulate the plant, simulate the plasma, but actually also simulate the control system so that you can then figure out what settings you need in the control system um, and to make this an interactive tool. So we have started down this journey and it will be a, um, I believe, a very, very fruitful one. Five minutes. So getting back to Ida, I discussed the EDA Worldwide Network, the, and I discussed that it's really a loose confederation of programs and basically people exchange. So we need, and our vision is to integrate a, a data science ecosystem and to embed this in the worldwide network of facilities that are preparing for EDA. And we need to integrate the level, level of the data, level of the networks, level of the analysis, computing, and modeling infrastructure. And this simply does not exist. We are really ahead internationally. And our discussions with international leaders are very, uh, very positive in terms of being able to extend this. Uh, beyond our borders, once we demonstrate its utility. The, mo the model that we're seeking is, it's not exactly identical, but it's the model of the worldwide LHC computing grid. We want to see an international computing grid that will not only help support research on current devices, uh, but to also support EDA operation and to stand up this infrastructure for EDA when EDA comes online. And again, this is a nice plot to show that we've got through ESNet a lot of experience doing this internationally, and we believe that uh, we, we can uh, do so uh, for fusion, but it requires immediate action. So the, we strongly believe that the US, through OSCAR, FES, and NSF partnership can lead the world developing the data science ecosystem for ITER and fusion. So finally, the, um, the message that I convey and that I'm going to convey in Washington is we know what we're doing. 
we've achieved real traction. We've got strong interest from the scientific community to develop and build out this infrastructure. We have a vision for what this seamless integrated data ecosystem, what the pieces need to be. We don't have much time to develop this and to make it ready in time to serve the needs of EDA and a future pilot plant in the US. Now is the time to really invest in it with urgency and determination to build this infrastructure because we know from the LHC experience it takes years. It takes years. And we have we have no time. We we must do now. Right, thank you. So, uh, question about the, the Fusion Data Platform. So, is there? Uh, I mean, uh, are there thoughts on where where's maybe the you know where are the locations that data reside? I mean, I, I feel like that might be one of the harder questions. Of, and what are the the challenges that you're dealing with right now in establishing this? Because I can imagine. There are a lot of challenges. <laughs> Brian. Yeah. Brian, can you come up to the microphone for us? Come on, Brian. Thank you. So, the the question was, what are the, the main challenges? Well, so. One is like, do you already have in mind where the data resides? Is it everywhere? And then kind of what are your biggest challenges in, in this space? Uh, well, the, the main idea I think with the Fusion Data Platform is that it, it'll be federated. And, and what we're doing is working with uh, UCSD and the San Diego Supercomputing Center to, to leverage their uh, open science data federation stack to do the distribution that way. And so, uh, for the first iteration, the plan is to have the data actually physically hosted at GA, but then uh, as, as their terminology is they have origins and caches, and so, so there'll be a, a origin and caches that can be pretty much anywhere you want, uh, but for the first proof of concept, it will, it'll be at uh, SDSC. Um, and then that can be expanded out, uh, you know, it, however we want in the future, uh, we can have multiple origins and multiple caches all, all over the world. And then, and then that model will sort of um, be something we can, we can, you know, distribute to places like uh, Princeton, MIT, um, either uh, UK, whatever. Uh, so in, in terms of the, the, the challenges, um, uh, there, there's plenty. Uh, <laughs> um, the, the, the fusion data is um, there's lots of variety to the data, and so and so there's not just one way of of, of handling it. There, there's many different uh, dimensionalities to it, many different time scales, uh, many different. So it's 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 a very much a multimodal problem, and historically there hasn't been. Uh, a, a standard way of dealing with it. And so that's, that's sort of one of the things we're trying to sort of get a handle on is, is converging towards a more unified representation of the data and a more unified way of, um, of, of, of accessing it. And, and actually really, um, I would say probably the number one problem that we really face right now as of today is that the data exists in silos and it's behind um, sort of difficult user agreements and, and not everybody can access it, right? So, so that's, that's really the broad vision is, is to, to democratize the access to it using fair principles and, uh, and really sort of standardize and, and, and make it so that the broader uh, data science, machine learning, AI communities can actually access it and do useful things with it. That's, that's really what we want. The other challenge I think is that the the hardware to do the analysis at scale is not part of the original funding. And so as Oscar is moving towards uh, HPDF and 
a robust data science infrastructure for model development. Uh, that is something we need to keep in mind because again, we are not directly funded to provide the, uh, the hardware resources. Right. Um, so um, uh, you've been talking a lot about um, adopting several aspects of the LUC collaborations as a, as, as a model. One of the things that um, that community uh, does explicitly is include the uh, systems operations staff and uh, sort of computing infrastructure software stack developers as part of the collaboration. And um, most other fields don't do that uh, to their detriment. And uh, so this, this, this is something that, you know, if you, if you, if you go and talk to, to um, leaders in the LHC community, right, they spend a huge amount of effort on computing infrastructure and software infrastructure, in addition to developing science codes and experiment operation. And um, it is, I, I, I recommend that when, when you're talking to um, funding agency leadership, that you include that in your narrative, because uh, a lot of them think of people who operate computers as IT. And that's a cost center and it needs to be minimized and get that out of my face because I'm working on the science and that's what the value is. Right. And the vision that you've presented, I think, is, is spot on, right? Where it, it in, if you can integrate the computing and the data analysis, right, it makes the science much more productive, makes the entire experiment operation, the, the entire scientific ecosystem more productive. But uh, it is, I would like to be wrong about this, but I expect that will require a cultural change in the funding agencies. And so I think that's a sociological effort that we would do well to embark upon explicitly. We hear you very clearly. Perhaps the way is platform development and maintenance. One of the things that we will convey when we go to Washington is that we really need a, an operations team, if you will, comprising of your expertise here and our domain expertise at GA and elsewhere to meet the growing demand and needs of our community. This, this is a service. It is not a thing. It is service. And service needs ongoing staff to maintain, operate, optimize, and, and enable a very a positive user experience. And it can take many forms, fundamental applied math and, and, and physics issues. We were talking about grid generation, for instance, as being one of the bottlenecks and another workflow that people want to implement. A simple thing like automated grid that will allow a code to execute reliably and robustly 90% of the time instead of 10% of the time. These things and many other issues that's going to be applied now and just software development, we're going to be running into them as we expand the super facility capability and as we provide these platforms as services to the community. And it's going to be extremely important. You're absolutely right. A key ally of ours is uh, Frank Worthwing, we recognized his value as a partner with us very early on because of his deep understanding, knowledge, and experience of how the high energy physics community works. And we really bring that culture into what we're doing. Thanks a lot for that suggestion, Elon. All right, any uh, last questions? So I know that there's been some um, uh, collaborations also with Argonne, and I was wondering, you know, is the hope to bring super facility to all the other like leadership computing facilities so that 
you can run your workflow in a variety of places. I'd, I'd like Dave Chisel. Dave, you need to speak to the. No, no, Dave, you need to speak to the microphone. Come on, come on, Dave. You can answer this directly. Dave has worked very closely with Argon, and we've got lots of plans in that direction. Yeah. Also, sort of reminds me of the Three Stooges, right? But uh, yes, Argon. Yeah, I mean, we work with. Mike Papka and others there. We have a very different workflow we're doing at Argon, but the idea would be in IRI is we as a user facility, we don't really care where the code runs. We just want it to run in a timely fashion. So absolutely, that's a, that's a group we're working with too. And the idea would be to do you know something we can run here, we could run there and vice versa. And you really show that you can demonstrate how it works in a cohesive unified fashion. So yeah. yeah. Papka and the digital twin project that Dave is running is directly working with Argon to do particle order calculations. Yeah. All right, any questions? Well, thank, thank you very much for your questions yes. and for your attendance. It's yes. terrific and it's a great pleasure to be here. Well, thank you very much for joining us today.